Yeah, actually, uh, most of my talk um, is science, less pencil, because I haven't actually done a lot of it. So, uh, let me uh, get started. So, uh, a quick outline, I'll firstly talk to you about what a protoplanetary disk is, in case you don't know. Um, finish up, uh, continue with some slides about the chemistry that's involved, and finish up with a few slides about the challenges that are involved in moons. Okay, so what is protoplanetary disk? Um, the disks are essentially the remnants of star formation, sort of the garbage of star formation processes. So this star forms from uh, contracting uh, in falling length of the cloud, and if there's any nuclear momentum that's left over in the cloud, it sort of helps to flatten the disk into uh, flatten the cloud into a disk. And so I'm primarily interested in the late stage, late stages of this evolution, um, when the disks have um, turned from optically thick, optically and geometrically thick, uh, into thin disks. Um, primarily because this is uh, sort of the uh, birth region for uh, plants, and that's sort of the ultimate goal of, of this work. So again, um, the material the material in the disk is in some some either Keplerian or basically Keplerian rotation around the star, um, which provides uh, a number of things with the existence of some kind of viscosity, uh, in particular the dynamical instability, which everybody likes to talk about uh, because you know they're exciting. Um, but the really things I want you to take away is that the disks are highly irradiated by the, this, the star, protostar, uh, especially in the X-ray, the UV, and certainly in the thermal. So the uh, material in the star tends to be partially ionized, dirty plasmas, um, especially near the surface regions, but not so much uh, towards the midplane. And like most uh, astrophysical systems that we work with, there are order of magnitude variations in the kind of disk parameters like density, temperature, uh, and chemical, uh, <coughs> chemical um, abundance. Okay, so a little bit about chemistry of the disks. Uh, in the upper regions of the disk, they, uh, the, the, the material tends to be quite dust poor because the dust is settled under the action of gravity. So you end up with a hot gas phase chemistry that's uh, primarily dominated by carbon hydrogen with an admixture of oxygen and uh, nitrogen. And like I said, the, uh, the regions are very strongly ionized due to X ray and uh, UV. At the midplane, um, in the opposite, so, so as I said, this is quite hot. I mean, the, these coronas, people call them coronas in, in analogous to stellar uh, studies. And it's actually a pretty good analogy because sometimes the, these upper irradiated zones can be maybe 5,000 Kelvin, which is quite hot. And the midplane on the opposite, the opposite extreme is very cold, where temperatures may be about 10 Kelvin or so. And um, because there's very little uh, irradiation, the ionization fraction is extremely low, if there's any at all. Um, a lot of the species are frozen onto grain mantles because it's so cold. And any kind of irradiation that is there is going to be due to cosmic rays and radio nuclides. But uh, even, these, even these sources are extremely, extremely weak. I think cosmic rays um, are something like six orders of magnitude weaker than, than the UV. So not a lot going on there, maybe. So of course, in the intermediate region, there's this balance between these. Uh, there's some UV. Any UV that get, doesn't get attenuated in the upper regions um, that mix through. Um, so there's lots of active species, lots of interactions between dust and gas, uh, sublimation, which means uh, uh, ices that are transforming directly into vapor and so on. So and this is, in uh, most studies in astrochemistry, this is called the warm molecular layer. So here's a sort of a cartoon, as you see, um, sort of layered paradigm for disks, where you have this the cold midplane, what's uh, this hot upper layer, and the warm molecular layer. <coughs> the outer regions are thought to be sort of mostly turbulent, and the inner regions are essentially advecting. So you have this transition region where your turbulent media is going to strongly advecting media, and uh, trying to understand what that looks like is important because this is a part of the planet forming region. So, as I said, if you can see, I don't know if you can make out the variation in the color here, but um, this sort of middle region right here, indicated by two, is the warm molecular layer. And you see the big spikes and all the different kinds of chemical species water, uh, hydrogen cyanide, and so on. Okay, so, so that's a little about the chemistry of the disks. So I'm, now I'm going to go back and talk to you just about chemistry, because I don't know about you, but I slept through most of the chemistry classes I had in school. Um, the, uh, there's lots of different kinds of reactions, right? So rushing networks, there are some reactions that take, have very few reactants, just like hydrogen, uh, electrons, protons, and helium, and others that have hundreds of species and thousands of reactions. In our particular case, we're interested in including <coughs> reactions that include uh, grain, grain, grain uh, formation and grain catalysis. There's also a variety of regimes, there's very fast reactions, very slow reactions, and radio reactions, which tend to be sort of in the middle somewhere. 
And the way these things are modeled are through the use of chemical networks, which essentially are big uh, systems of reaction kinetic equations, and the rates of which are gotten from uh, databases like the UMIS database, the latest iteration of which I think is uh, rate of six, mostly. That's mostly so. so types of reactions that are included, um, we have radiative association where uh, photons, are photons are emitted after the reaction, uh, reactions where grains actually are catalyzing the reaction, so the two elements go off together and what it bliss. Um, reactions, dissociation reactions where uh, the photon actually destroys the molecules and so on. And you can also have morphological type reactions where uh, the ion fraction really doesn't change, but just after the abundances of various species change. So, large variation. There's different kinds of reaction rates depending on what kind of reactions there are. The very standard sort of kinetic equations like, uh, I don't know, like 2H2 plus O2 makes water kind of thing. Um, these are called, these are typically uh, fortified by Arrhenius type reactions that are parameterized by three different parameters alpha, beta, gamma, which can be committed depending on temperature and the temperature, temperature itself. Um, photoreactions depend on uh, extinction coefficients. Uh, cosmic rays can uh, have a variety of different parameterizations, but all of them take into the fact that uh, cosmic ray, cosmic ray uh, ionizations happen because you have to find the right cosmic ray in the right part of the disk that finds the right atom to ionize at the right time. So the probabilities are tend to be low. And of course there are grain surface reactions where um, the rates are dependent on the properties of the hydrogen gas or whatever gas you have, um, and dust and some energy in terms. So what kind of time scales are we looking at? I put the, some sort of standard uh, reaction types up here, and you can see that the reaction, reaction time scales differ by several orders of magnitude. Which is a big difference, a big problem if you actually want to compute these things. Um, you know, if you know anything about this stuff, you're going to be doing SIP equations and you have to do SIP solvers and stuff, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, what are what do net chemical networks look like? Um, the networks themselves are actually fairly simple. They're just typically uh, coupled ODEs, where you're you're uh, you have time-dependent equations for your uh, chemical concentrations. You have formation and destruction processes. So, like here, you have the species J and K. Uh, produce species I, and species uh, I gets destroyed by species J, okay, so hence the minus sign. And you can add in all kinds of terms here. I put in uh, photoreactions where uh, formation and destruction terms for uh, some species I. And if you have different kinds of reactions, you have different terms. If you have species, uh, reactions with uh, maybe five or six elements, you have more of these N, J, N, K, N, L, N, M, N, M. So as many terms as you want, essentially. So, but this is, so this is just sort of schematic. So in concluding with this, uh, this ODE set, you have some kind of particle conservation equation because you don't want your uh, particles to go off into space. Right? So how do you actually solve these on a computer? Well, if, if you're doing a, some kind of steady state thing, you just set the derivative equal to zero and you do some Newton wraps and it's very easy. Right? But you might not have that. You might have the case where the material is being injected or uh, in some particular way I put some radial and, uh, um, Z component for the injection. So you actually need to go and do some uh, solving some ODEs. No big deal. Okay, so here's an example of a, of a chemical network from the uh, literature. This is Massimo and Prudgers who published this last year, and they were interested in looking at how ion fractions uh, change the size and extent of the dead zone in uh, protoplanetary disks. So you can't really see this very well, but what they're, what they're doing is they're just doing five reactions, and they're interested in electrons, uh, metal ions, positive metal ions, neutral grains, positive grains, and negatively charged grains. And there's a closure relation. And you can't really see this on here, but these are the rate coefficients for the various equations. And they're basically only dependent on temperature. And, temperature, 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 so on. and the grain equations are dependent on the grain size. And you see here that, uh, well you probably can't see here, um, that the, the rate equations are dependent on um, factors that uh, go over five orders of magnitude. So uh, again, instead of the example of the equations. Okay, so, so that's the sort of basic chemical review and what it means to do chemical modeling. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about now the challenges that are faced uh, in doing this kind of work. So everybody in this room knows uh, that doing this work is hard. I don't need to tell you that. Um, and that there are a lot, a lot of interdependencies, and that's what makes, part of, make, makes it hard. Um, in particular, uh, of course, in chemistry, you have to worry about the thermodynamics and the thermodynamic impact of the chemistry. You have heat being drawn from and dumped into the hydrodynamics and the thermodynamics. You have uh, changes in opacity, so uh, your chemistry might affect your, the abundances of your gas and grains or the properties of the gas and grains. 
which affects how your radiative uh, throughput, affects the radiative throughput into the medium, which is again associated with how the chemistry works. So it's sort of a cycle. And of course, everybody loves to talk about the ionization fraction for things like MRI. And of course, there's chemical mixing. The material is actually moving around, around the disk and changing the abundances everywhere. So all these kinds of interdependencies uh, create lots of problems. Okay, so here's just a cartoon. I wrote up a bunch of equations. This is fun. Now here's a bunch of chemical equations, some um, radiative transfer stuff, energy, momentum, and so on. And I, and I know I missed some arrows, but the point is that you have to solve all these equations. And these are the sort of and most of the people in the room mostly do this kinds of stuff, unless you're Toby, who likes to be torture himself, he does this kind of stuff, and I want to throw that stuff in too, and it hasn't even put in any magnetic fields. Not that I know how magnetic fields affect the chemistry, because I'm not a chemist. Okay. So, it's a lot of work, and um, another part that makes it hard is that, there, like I said before, there's a variety of regimes that you have to take into account. If you want to make sort of a generic interface, um, then you're going to have to worry about Reactions, reactions that are combustive. So you're dumping maybe 10 to the 30 ergs of energy into your hydro in you know a few seconds. Whereas you might have also at the same time have to worry about thermally neutral reactions, which take place over long periods of time and which don't do anything to the hydro. And you might have things that are reactions that are have combinations of that. And here's an example of the PV1 chain, which I talked to Axel about already. And here you have 16 orders of magnitude difference between these reaction rates. Right? One takes gig year, and the other one takes seconds. So you have to you want, to, you want to do this accurately, right? So this is a tough problem for chemistry. All right. So um, this is this. I don't really need to read through. The point is that operator splitting is what everybody does, and we're just adding another step in to put in your reaction kinetics. And um, the point is that if you have these big stiff equations and orders of magnitude difference in the time scales. You probably don't want to do something explicit where you're subcycling the reactions um, based on the time steps from your hydro. You want to do something implicit in some way. Um, and how you actually integrate all of the thermodynamic uh, quantities that you get out of your reaction kinetics, how you update those with all your hydro equations and hydro variables, is something you really have to work on and keep straight. So, um, okay, so a bit about solvers now. Um, and this is the part that anybody who does numerics, which I'm not really an numerics person, uh, will probably yell at me about. So of course, I hope I've gotten the point, across the point that you have stiff systems, right? So you have stiff systems, explicit methods like Norma or Adams methods, or you know, regular Buhler's store is not going to work very well because you have these large variations in the time step. So uh, you turn to various kinds of implicit methods. There's Rosenbrock methods, which I think is the same thing as Norma Kutta and Goldberg, I think it's the same kind of thing. There's uh, the standard way a lot of people do this outside of hydro, the chemical modeling that is, is using backward differentiation. And there's a number of codes that are publicly available, like uh, VOD and LSWD, that, that actually are doing, um, essentially solving the chemical equations by doing lots of inverting of Jacobians over and over and over. There are asymptotic methods, which I'll mention more about in a minute. Hybrid methods, which include multiple, a multiple of these. Um, Semi-implicit type of store methods. Uh, which are sometimes useful. And there's also methods for reducing the order of the chemical systems by uh, regrouping where the, where the, uh, where the, how the reactions actually sit in your matrices. So you're actually basically doing, if you think of the, uh, think of the big reaction network as a manifold, you're basically sort of uh, uh, doing projections of the manifold into sort of sub-chemical spaces. And so that works for some cases as well. The point here is that we don't want the chemistry, the chemistry could easily dominate the hydro. So what we really want out of our solver is we want a very small memory put, footprint and little CPU cost, as little as possible. And we also have to worry about what kind of accuracy needs uh, we have. So I know pencils, pencils got very high accuracy generally, and chemical solvers tend not to. So uh, that's one of the main issues that I don't know a lot about. So what we'd like is something that's single step. In other words, we don't have to take um, as in like a backward differentiation method, we don't need information from a lot of previous steps in our, to define our solutions. And something that's implicit, so we don't have to worry about long, long time stepping. And one or no Jacobian versions, because Jacobian versions take a lot of time. So we, have exactly, we, we are exactly the same problem than uh, with uh, our implicit method. Yeah. That's typically the problem, the question that... Uh, yeah, it's always the question, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, so one of the, I said I would mention a little bit about asymptotic methods, and one of the popular ways to do this is what are called quasi-steady-state solvers. 
And as an example, you're, you could sort of rewrite your chemical network to something like this, where your species equations actually have some coupling, and then you have other parts that don't have any coupling. And if you assume that uh, these variables Q and P are constants, then you can solve it analytically. And the idea is to take this, and for each subset, uh, each uh, step size H, you get some expression where this alpha term here looks like that. And the idea is to take this expression and use it in sort of a predictor-corrector type of way. And by doing, uh, doing this, you should be able to get some kind of stable second-order scheme, which uh, seems to be sort of as good as you get, um, from what I've read anyway. Um, but it's all dependent on actually producing good values of alpha and uh, sort of good expressions for these quantities of fruit and Q. These are somewhat like slate schemes. I don't know. I don't know what that is. Maybe. I mean, it means that the time derivative is. Um, in the slip schemes, also okay. the typical alpha, the exponent type will come stays. The P. I mean, if the time derivative was uh, unimportant, it was in slip, hmm. oh. then you can, of course, solve that y is equal to q divided by p. Mm -hmm. So that would be a first approximation. And that is going to do better. And that's what you're doing. I think you have to, yeah, you have to turn Q over P, of course, in the middle equation. And then our additional. People, in this case, of course, most of the literature that I've read is about uh, the newest stuff is about four years old. So I have to, yeah, there might be newer stuff out there that makes it more accurate or whatever. <coughs> so, OK, so that's the. Uh, that's sort of the best solver that's on the market so far that I know of. Um, but of course, I don't have any, haven't done any testing with it yet, because I just sort of started. Um, so uh, that's how I'll solve it. How am I going to stick it into pencil? Well, of course, we have all these reaction networks. And suppose you have a reaction network that has you know, 100 species or something. Well, how are you going to actually put that into code? You don't want to hardwire it, because then it's this big, huge, lovely code that nobody wants to look through. So the idea is to use some kind of parsing system where you, you put in these sort of uh, dot in type files with your chemical reactions, with the type of uh, solver you're going to use, what precision you want. Uh, maybe another file with the species and their initial abundances, and maybe another file with the actual schematics for the re reactions and the rates. And what you do then is just use all the existing infrastructure that's in pencil, and when you hit start, start checks to see if chemistry is on. And if it is, it parses all this stuff writes all the chemistry, uh, relevant chemistry stuff directly into the source and enables the appropriate solvers and so on and so on and you're ready to go. You don't actually have to do a lot of work once you've actually specified all this stuff. So I guess it wouldn't be started X, it would be made at best yes. because <coughs> you, you compile and then you have to compile the code. But, but after writing all the equations um, right, 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 right. So that's that's a generic uh, scheme. I mean, the, the biggest problem is this is not hard. I mean, you just have to write the parser to get that right. And the, I think the hardest part is actually doing the testing for uh, computing, doing the testing for which kind of solvers actually work the best, um, and actually then then sort of spreading it instead of spreading it out, starting off with systems that you know work that aren't particularly stiff, and then you're going up to something like the TP1 machine that's extremely stiff and see if that actually works. Especially like like when you're dumping energy into the hydro and stuff. So that's all I have. Mm -hmm. Yes, a big problem is a uh, uh, fact you have exactly the same problem than, uh, than uh, your. It means that you have to mix uh, the explicit uh, part of the code with uh, an implicit one. Yes. And uh, we have one solution, but maybe. Uh, we can discuss about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that actually <coughs> the Benji code is uh, fully explicit. Huh? And then uh, if you want to add an implicit part in, a, in temporal uh, integration, it's not uh, quite uh, evident for the moment. Huh? That's not true. Yeah. Well, I, think, I think the, uh, the, the essential okay. idea, let me see if I go back here. Uh, The essential idea that I think is that most of this, most of this, most of the reaction kinetics can actually be done on a fixed background. So you're not actually going to be doing, um, 
like the sort of actually including, as I mentioned before, those advective terms in the chemistry of you are going to be doing that? Sure, but the problem of consensus, uh, when you, you integrate the implicitly your equation, mm -hmm. uh, you have some source term which come from the explicit physics, mm -hmm. and those source term are uh, when, for example, if you use operator, sp operator splitting, uh, that's like a jungle. Huh? You know, uh, when you when you deal with operator splitting, you you have to choose how much uh, part of the source term should I put in the x direction or y direction, for example. And there, there is no uh, simple rule to, uh, for that. Yeah. It's like cooking. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Sometimes you get burned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as I, as I said, I haven't really done started with this. I mean, I'm just starting to write the code now. And uh, the, the sort of solvers and stuff, and, and actually how this is going to work out right, I don't know. Yeah. I know we it have will work because people do yeah. it. Yeah. But yeah, but people do it without giving any uh, information. Uh, you see a lot of paper. Uh, that, yes, we we deal with uh, yeah. we deal uh, this term using implicit. Well, scale. I know. Well, I know also that some of these terms, like uh, this this uh, chemic, is mm. a it's a chemistry. Uh, people in chemistry use this, and it, this actually has this some kind of hybrid method. It uses explicit and implicit solvers for different parts of the system. But how well I know it's widely used, so it must work fairly well. Either that, or nobody else wants to write a solver, right? yeah. which is possible. So. Would there not be also diffusion terms in, in the chemistry? Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. And they are. I might just included in some of the stuff. That's the that's the thing about chemistry that that's that's extremely hard. I think is that you actually there's a lot of, of the parts of, of uh, pencil or any kind of hydro code that you need to work in there somewhere. It's not just that you. Uh, you run your chemistry and then move it across the grid. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of extra stuff. But, but I mean, it doesn't make a difference whether there's diffusion or not. That, that's just going to end up in exactly the same place where the adaption term ends. True, true. Which means it's, it's just that the, the okay. hydro part, including diffusion, um, is a term that appears somewhere in your, in your reaction grid. Sure. Um, I have one comment. Boris mentioned operator splitting again. He said everybody does it. I mean, right now we don't do it. Right. So right, right now we just write the equations and whether you add a, a, a solve term or a, a, an effective term earlier or later in the in the in your routine doesn't make a difference. Right now we, we get around this. Yeah, we are doing that now. Well, so you, you are, but yeah. not but, but not the pencil code. That is in the yes, it's not commit because it's. Uh, so the it's order, the order that actually is working. Yeah. Whether, whether you compute your energy terms so you if, 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 if we can do this, if we can hook this chemistry stuff into the time stepping we're doing now, then the order doesn't matter. What Boris is doing, and he's going to talk about that tomorrow, is doing it the other way around, hooking the hydro step. Uh, the, high, the information from the hydro step of the pencil code into an implicit scheme, into a scheme that does operate split. And that, that may be the easy way of doing it, although I feel somehow bad about seeing the, the existing pencil code being enslaved by some, <laughs> some, some alien uh, method. But maybe that's the way to do this. And, that, that's, that's something we'll talk about tomorrow, I guess. Why is that? I mean, the, it's already, the, the PDF is already uh, simply being caught by the time set routine. We have, we have the time set routine, which is not very difficult, and that just caught your PDF. So in some sense, your PD is pretty low down already in the whole, I would see. Not very high. And so now you just uh, do chemis some kind of a chemistry solver, which is really more, more than a implicit solver. And that just sorts the course, whatever it has to call. But the time step is different. Time step is very different. So you have to do operator splitting. If, if, if we use an implicit uh, approach to some terms, then I don't see why we would need operator splitting. 
I mean, that's, that's, that's just a different approach. Many, many tones just, just um, need that operator splitting because, because they use a, a very different approach in the first place. It, it's, 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 we have a different philosophy from most codes that use operator splitting. So I, I, I don't think many of the rules that apply there necessarily apply here. But it's it, the, the, the most straightforward way of, of or plan for doing this would really be um, to, to, to do something clever about the, the evolution equation for the chemical um, concentrations in PDE. So we still use the same thing, we evaluate the right hand side, we do something clever so so um, what we do ends up to be an implicit scheme for the chemistry. And probably that can be done, but it's not exactly that simple. If we do something too clever in PDE, if we if our Roman Kutta substeps do better than first order and and explicit than explicit first order in time, then the overall scheme will stop being third order, it will only be first order in time, <laughs> unless, unless we, we, we do some, some more work in order to get around that. So that's, that's counterintuitive. If we do two good subs, three good sub steps in our Runge Kutta scheme, then the overall uh, scheme degrades in order. If we just do explicit first order in the sub steps, then that's, that's what the scheme is tuned for and then it manages to to cancel out the terms in delta t, delta, in delta t squared, so we, we really have to order. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an additional complication that yes, came, came, came as a surprise to me. Yes, and that's what I do not understand actually. It, uh, it's uh, when you mix explicit and implicit scheme, is to find the truncation error. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's uh, not easy to, to follow the, the error. Uh, between explicit and implicit. You can be second order, um, you can have a second order accuracy in explicit scheme and implicit scheme, but the overall, uh, the whole scheme, the truncation rule of the whole scheme is, yeah. <laughs> is not evident to, to you. Know. This is, I mean, the, the, the talks are just a big outline, right? I mean, the amount of work involved in actually getting this working, I think, is actually quite, quite substantial, just because of all the, you know, integrating these kinds of schemes together with I would like to make some uh, comments on the blackboard, maybe. Uh, so I, uh, I will see this. <coughs> sort of 